I have a lot to show you in 18 minutes. Um, and I just want to explain the title of the project, uh, Language of Performance. Um, for us in our office, that means that we're really working towards an architecture that includes a very strong environmental influence. And it's not what about the building looks like, because we're all over the world. We're in China, we're in the Middle East, we're in North America, Korea, um, Kazakhstan, hopefully. Um, but it's at, what is at the core of what those buildings are and how they behave and what is it that they embrace when they think about the wind and the sun and the soil and the people who use them and the people who occupy them. So uh, Nigel, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm going to try and forward this. This is actually, as Nigel said, where I was born. Ten minutes maybe from here. And I haven't been back to Kingston in 39 years. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, I have so much to see uh, this week, um, and I'm excited about it. This is an exaggeration of where I grew up, because I couldn't see a house from where I grew up. There's pictures in this. We, I grew up in Sinan. When where I grew up, there was nothing, just hills. And when I was 11, we moved here. It's cold. <laughs> it's nice, but it's cold. And I learned a lot about the differences between these places and how people live and how people move and what it means to freeze your hands off that first winter and what it means when you can't hang your laundry outside anymore in December. And now I live here in Chicago. So there are three of us, there are three partners, Adrian Smith, myself, and Bob Forrest, that run our firm. We started the firm seven years ago this October. So we're just seven. <laughs> but we have a lot of experience in doing projects all over the world. And I'm gonna show you some of those projects today. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what we're trying to achieve. So this is one of them. This is Mazdar headquarters, five stories tall, about a million square feet in Abu Dhabi. It was designed as the world's most efficient large scale building. So this building actually creates more energy than it uses on an annual basis. And what you've heard so far today is not just so much about the technology that goes into these things, but really what is the attitude about this project? What are the attitudes about the design? And really what the attitude is is that you really should need less. Not so much that you have to use less, but can we put you in a position where you just simply need less? That you don't have to alter your life, that you don't have to live differently, that you just need less to do the same things you're doing now, or maybe even more. So this building, is based on an indigenous typology, a courtyard home. So there are nine courtyards, those green circles you see, that are defined by nine cones, and those cones basically create a giant umbrella on top of the building that shade the entire building. And the reason that was important is because somebody had to go out there and build this building in this heat. In Abu Dhabi, the ambient, ambient air temperature is 120 degrees. So if you've ever been there, walk outside, it's like an oven. I know Kingston is hot, but it's not that hot. <laughs> it's hot. And I tell you, it's hot. It's steamingly hot, staggeringly hot. Um, the kind of hot where if you have to walk from a building to another building, it kind of can hurt you. It can in influence how you breathe. So here, they shut down the construction if it's 44 degrees Celsius or somewhere in the neighborhood of 110. So what we decided to do is to prefabricate the structure, that PCC on top, and have them build that first quickly. So then they could build the rest of the building in shade. That means they don't have to punish themselves while they're building the building. That is a section or a cut through the project. This is one of the cones or one of the courtyards, and every cone has a garden. Inside of that cone, they're huge. They're 90 meters or 200 feet at the base, and they go up to a narrow spot. And the reason they go up to another narrow spot is so that the light that comes in there, we can manage it. So we're trying to bring the light in and keep the heat out. There are 37 different systems that come together. So think of the buildings as plants, as their own kind of ecosystem that works together in harmony to actually improve each other so that they can do better. And I think of my buildings or our buildings as children. I love my children, we have four children. And the idea is that those children will grow up to contribute. Not just take, but contribute. 
the kind of people that will walk on the street and pick up a piece of garbage even though they weren't the ones that dropped it. So we need these buildings to contribute, give back to their society, give back to their environment in tangible ways, measurable ways, useful ways. This is a view of one th inside the court. This was early on when we were starting to design this. And they're all different. Each one has its own identity, its own character. Some of the spaces inside. And the idea of all of this is so that you can be comfortable. So on this project, we had to fight 17 scientists for three years to show and prove every single aspect of the project. We had to prove how comfortable you would be in each space for a certain amount of time. And it matters on what you're wearing, whether you're in a suit, whether you're in shorts and a t-shirt, or if you're an indigenous dress of the region because you're in Abu Dhabi. So that became very specific. And there's something else about the kind of carbon measurement or the embedded carbon that we use. So the embedded carbon is you trace the footprint of how the actual materials were made to measure how they perform from a carbon footprint standpoint. So it's one thing to say, this is a really nice product. But the question is, what did it take to make that product? And the same thing is true for cars. And you heard Al Gore talk about cars versus buildings. Buildings are three times worse than cars with respect to carbon. Three times. And here they said, we're going to measure everything you guys do to figure out the carbon footprint. We're going to measure your food, what you eat, if you eat steak versus salad, we're going to measure how many times you fly back and forth between Chicago and Abu Dhabi. And we're going to measure all that because we want to offset it. We want to figure out what it's going to take to offset the carbon footprint of your work and your travel. So, concrete. Probably one of the worst offenders of carbon because of the heat required to make cement and concrete. If I'd known this when I was a boy in Sinan, I wouldn't have torn up my parents' backyard to build all those little houses. But it's, car it's concrete. The irony of that is that for all the travel we did, for everything we did back and forth for three years, all we had to do in this building is take out three concrete piles. That means if you think of a pile that's 100 feet deep, maybe the width of this room or a little more, you take out three of those, and you can offset all the carbon for all that travel. So for all the talk about all the bad things that happen with cars and planes and trucks, in buildings, you can really make a huge difference. And there's not one of us who doesn't engage a building in some way, shape, or form. This is the underneath the roof trellis. Because of the microclimate that we created there, we actually grew fruit trees. So we can actually have fruit for the people that work in the building. And this is in Abu Dhabi. So for them, this is amazing. For you, it's nothing. <laughs> This is the temperature. The yellow is the 120, and that's the building performance. This is a thermal model, and we do this for every building we build. <laughs> now, the key here is just to understand the simple things of stepping into the shade <laughs> versus sitting in the sun, right? Kind of common sense. The technology behind this building is primarily passive. Its orientation is passive. The skin, the exterior wall on the building is organized so it's passive. And without any technology whatsoever, this building is 50% more efficient than a standard building of the same type. With the technology, this building is actually producing more power than any building in the world. That's the roof. This is how it does it, photovoltaics. That's a 300,000 square foot photovoltaic roof lots of sun. But to be fair, we have to think about what we're doing with the cleaning of that, what the degradation of that material is. And we have to take all of that into consideration before we say, this is how great we're doing. So we have to live with these things. And we have to, we have to collect the data on them and be honest about what it is that we're saying. When we finished that project, we were asked to do this project in Chicago, the one on the left. The one on the right is Sears Tower, built in 1976. The one on the left, the client asked us to do a zero energy building, a new hotel. We said no. And we said no because economically it didn't make sense in Chicago because energy is cheap. I was stunned to hear what Chris said about, about the price of electricity here. 
but that's something that we should really talk about. Here we said no. But what we asked is what's going on in the existing building. And we found out that by tackling the existing building, we could take out huge amounts of energy and then offset the new building. Every single window in Willis Tower at the time was the equivalent to one SUV. One window was the equivalent to one SUV worth of emissions for a year. There are 9,000 windows. There are 10,000 calcs for it. We took out 68 million kilowatts. So what does that mean? <laughs> it's about the equivalent of 40,000 single-family homes in Chicago off the grid every single year. That makes a difference. We shave peak loads by taking the peak loads down because we can offset the morning load in the office with the night load in the hotel. We didn't have to increase our substation here to do it. And we talked to the utility company who spends hundreds of billions of dollars every year about how to offset this stuff because it's their investment and if they can save money, then you can save money. So we did this project to prove on a big scale how it would work. 450 buildings in downtown Chicago, 200 million square feet. We call it the DCAR plan. We figured out how to take every single thing because they're all related. Everything is related. Just like I'm kind of related. <laughs> everything is related. Whether it's in China, Abu Dhabi, all the principles work. You might see things that are bigger or smaller. It doesn't matter. Principles are principles. Just like people, principles are principles. We looked at everything and how they're related, and we figured out that we could tackle the project either technologically and spend two and a half billion dollars to take you know, the power out of the grid through photovoltaics or wind farms, but that wouldn't matter because we'd still be left with a city that, of a bunch of buildings that needed support. Or we could do it this way, through mixed use, through bringing residential and education into the, into the city and residential uses a quarter of the energy of office. And by creating a model that for the first time we can look at the interrelationships between buildings, where we can test what it is in my building that's affecting your building, where we can run scenarios, run the return on investment, and calculate the embedded carbon and save you that power. So it's not on an individual basis anymore. It's a group. It's a pluralistic approach to solving a problem as a whole not as individuals. As individuals, we can make differences. As groups, we can move mountains. And it doesn't matter how big it is. It can be big, well, let me see if I can flip it, or it can be small. You can look at it if it's a bunch of houses, or you can look at it as if they were the most tallest buildings in the world. And this is, this is actually a clip from a parametric model that we've been working on for three years. Now we've matured this model, and we're using it to model all kinds of projects in China, in, in the Middle East. And we run these scenarios now for a host of different issues. So if you want to change the use of the building, you can check it. If you want to change the exterior wall, you can check it. You can tell what kind of building or performance you're going to have based on what the relationship between its orientation and its use is. So south-facing walls, north-facing walls, so on and so forth. And we proved that in Chicago, we could actually densify the city and still lower the carbon footprint. Because just because you have more use or more buildings doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. It's how you do it. And this is the issue that we face as we go around the world. 60 million people into urban centers every year. So we're asked to do projects like these. And I'm going to flip through these quickly just to show you the magnitude of some of the impacts. We were given seven square kilometers to design for 100,000 people. We used one. We used one because we could. Most of these people are farmers. So we developed a low income uh, kind of product that we can then can move people into and then have them actually keep their farms and use those farms to feed the 100,000 people. We study wind for comfort, solar, everything that we think is going to influence how you live. Mixed use is better than single use, and these are the kind of models that we produce. These are the stats. Because we get to do things like this. 
over 2,000 feet in China. But we punctured the building so we could actually save on the concrete and the structure. Millions of dollars, thousands of uh, CO2 per year. In Seoul, office buildings, office tells that are shaped and carved to improve their performance so we can use less structure in some of the spaces that we create in those spaces, in those buildings. And the real one I want to get to is this. If everybody lived like we did in the States, we'd need four planets. <laughs> if everybody lived like they did in the Middle East, we need five and a half. Although these guys are good, they're not that good. You see the problem? But there's one place that is doing really well. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I actually did not know that. Um, Dr. Chris Drew in our office, I told him I was coming here. He said, let's check. He checked. You guys are doing great. <laughs> you are the model, whether you realize it or not. You are in perfect harmony. So listen to what guys like Christopher are telling you, and do it. Because it doesn't matter what the technology says. It's really the philosophy and the attitude that you have and how you use that technology. Because sometimes we get asked to do things like this. And that's the attitude we have to take even when we're asked to do the world's tallest building. And we just delivered this. 3,000 drawings for a project that's over 3,000 feet tall in Jeddah. It's under construction. It started. This will be the next world's tallest building. Don't be afraid. <laughs> You're all coming with me. I'm going to leave you with this, and I hope this runs for you. Thank you.